Hello, Michael Sankey here. Just a short presentation that was recently done to the ePortfolio Stories from Down Under, a joint session hosted by ABLE and ePortfolios Australia. This is 23 years of reflections on ePortfolio practice. Okay, I do want to acknowledge that I am coming to you from Charles Darwin University, and we acknowledge the First Nations peoples across the lands in which we live and work and pay respects to elders both past and present. I'm presenting to you from Larrakia land today. Just a quick thing about this presentation, lifelong learning is lifelong. And so when we're thinking about ePortfolios, we need to think about how we can sustain practice, not just for the time that we might be at a university, but also through into our professional practice. There are rest stops along the way on any journey uh, where we need to refresh and revive, and I'll talk through about some of those. Importantly, one needs to stay on the journey, though. So once we commit to something like your portfolios, if we believe in that journey, that is, we need to stick to that journey and stay the course. Except that metaphor indicates there's one road on our journey. And of course, most of us who have been involved in ePortfolios for a while realise that there are different tracks that we can go down, different forks in the road that we need to confront. And I'll talk through a couple of those. In reality, well, for me at least, there are multiple paths and different forks that I've had to walk down all perfectly reasonable and consistent with my professional journey. But the trick is to keep agile and to be purposeful in your activities. Just to change up the metaphor somewhat, here we are on our journey and we're getting from one side of the bank to the other and there are a number of stepping stones we might want to come across. My ePortfolio practice can be broken down into these steps over the last 27 years and both my own ePortfolio practice, but also the ePortfolio practiced as part of my teaching and how I've encouraged students to be involved in these practices as well. But I suppose even prior to my being in higher education, I was a photographer. I was a professional photographer and an artist. And I had to present a portfolio to get into art school back in the 70s. And prior to that, into in art classes and things at school, I was always having to put together art portfolios and things. So really, as far as my practice around portfolios is concerned, not e-portfolios, that goes right back to as far as I can remember. I don't remember putting a portfolio together at this point, but I must have. Surely I must have. My first e-portfolio, though, is, which I can trace as an official e-portfolio, uh, was started in 1997 while I was at the University of Southern Queensland, and we produced I produced a series of HTML pages that looked at my professional practice gave my CV and links and it gave people a, uh, a focus point uh, for them to access information about me. This is a, an image from the Wayback Machine. It's not uh, fully there because the, some of the links are broken, but it gives you a sense, and this was a screen cap taken in November 2003, of what it kind of looked like back then. So we're talking there, that screen cap 21 years ago. I also then started my first ePortfolio in a more modern context when I was at QT as a student and I was doing my doctorate there. And I used the very rudimentary QT ePortfolio platform, which really started to make me think a bit broader about the use of technologies and the particular use of portfolio in how I represent my practice as an emerging doctoral student as, as, and what that might lead to in academia after that. And so I think in around 2007, we had the beginning of the ePortfolios uh, projects, which were run out of QUT, and that really started to open up the sector in terms of what ePortfolio could do for education. Not too long after that, I, I, at USQ, we uh, implemented Mahara, the ePortfolio system, and I was able to uh, implement my own ePortfolio more formally in that context, I was also an alumni of, of USQ, and that continued through from 2009 to about 2022, and when I uh, swapped universities and then chose a different path, which I'll talk about in a sec. Uh, I went to Griffith University in 2018. We were using PebblePad, so I had to convert my portfolio over from Mahara into PebblePad, and for a while there, I was supporting two portfolios, and that went through to about well, now I'm still using uh, PebblePad as a tool for ePortfolio, but 
it's evolved that it's not necessarily my only e-portfolio. It's one of my e-portfolios. Probably more important to me now uh, as being a reasonably seasoned professional is my use of WordPress. Now, that started back in 2011 when I was having some leadership mentoring and I had a coach and they wanted me to start a blog site to talk about my professional practice. And so I started up a WordPress site and that WordPress site then started to evolve. So I'd finished that mentoring and it kind of sat there for a number of years. And so I thought, oh, okay, I need to think about how I can develop up that site as being the center of my uh, e-portfolio practice. So you'll see here from this timeline, very rudimentary timeline that started my practice in e-portfolio about 1997 and through to, to now, 2024, started with HTML pages, got into the QT portfolio. We started Mahara at, at UniSQ. Then uh, I started my WordPress site about 2011. And then where that arrow meets in is where I started to change my thinking. I started to move my Mahara portfolio over to WordPress because I USQ, Uni, UniSQ were changing their platform from Mahara to WordPress. And I'd had a WordPress site already. So I, I evolved my practice in there and kept going with my Pebble Pad. I tried to jettison that, but I can't because so many people link to it as a, as a good example of good practice. So I can't actually just get rid of my portfolio in Pebble Pad. So I'm kind of constrained to have a couple of portfolios at the moment, which is fine. That's not a big deal. However, the thinking around my portfolio in either form, it creates the center of my professional practice. And the michaelsankey.com site is the WordPress site. But from that site, I link backwards and forwards to a whole range of other sites. My SlideShare site or Google Slides, which I've now started to use more than share, SlideShare because of the ads on SlideShare. The thing to my LinkedIn, to my research gates, to my university research portal, uh, to Google Scholar, to Instagram, uh, to Orchid, to YouTube. All those sites are linked through my WordPress. But more importantly, on those sites, if you go to those sites, they will link back to my ePortfolio. And so your cloud will look different to this, but it's really important you have a good sense of what your cloud is. So in terms of staff portfolios, which mine predominantly is, but it forms the basis for my ePortfolio thinking for other things. As a professional, as an academic staff member, I need to be involved in teaching activities and research activities and service activities. Now, it gives me a place to house those activities and to showcase those activities. But associated with that are a number of other tools. You see under there, there's the orchids and those things I, I mentioned in that image of the cloud. So there are many options now for academic staff. You will not have exactly the same as I do. In fact, you probably won't. But there will be sites that you need to link together to form that greater picture of who you are as an academic or as a professional. But ePortfolio is not just about that. It's about also fulfilling learning, teaching, assessment activities. And that requires the, a different type of thinking. So if we look at student portfolios, they do more things like reflections and recording work integrated learning and doing assessment. And again, there are a whole range of tools for that. There's ePortfolio tool, there's journaling and blogging tools. And increasingly, we're seeing a lot of those tools being used. And so there are many more options available to us, to our students, into representing their learning. It's around them developing up their professional profile as emerging professionals. But they need guidance in that. They can't just, we can't just expect to give them a tool and say, you go away and create your ePortfolio. They need explicit guidance in terms of how they should think about this notion of an e-portfolio, what's public, what's private. Us as academics need to walk the talk. We need to actually have our own e-portfolio happening so we can start to understand in our own mind the value of this. But also, importantly, it's understanding how professionals out there are using their professional identities because we want to work our students toward this notion of them being open professionals and able to represent their professional journey in many ways. And there are multiple tools to that. ePortfolio is one of them. So if we think about the primary audience for a student ePortfolio, 
we think of future employers or current employers. Uh, we think of the collection of data. We think about clients and colleagues. We think about work placements and supervisors. We think about the educator and different educators across a program. We think about other students, the peers and alumni. And we think about the general public, whether that be family and friends and things. But then we look at the tools on the other side we need to think about using with them. And this is just one representation of those tools. But within ePortfolio, there is this notion that there are public pages, but also private pages where things might happen around grading and marking, uh, where we might have drafts or peer review activities or collaborative activities that we don't want the general public to see. There are also then, uh, of course, what we might do in terms of setting up a public, more public, uh, open profile in something like LinkedIn. Although LinkedIn, of course, itself is a closed system, many people in the professional world are on LinkedIn. And then, of course, there are other social media sites that we might use. So if we're thinking about private pages, who might want to have access to them? Well, it might be work placement supervisors, other educators and other students. In terms of that public pages we might have in our portfolio, it's future employers. Again, it's educators, other students, and maybe the general public as well. Then if we think about LinkedIn, it's of course the, um, the future employers that we want to impress that we, are, that we are a professional and we're an emerging professional. There are of course other students, alumni that we would like to work with and of course the general public. Then other social media sites, again, it's, it's uh, future employers and uh, other students and the general public again. I suppose with the advent of generative AI, We've seen the cat put amongst the pigeons in some of our assessments, uh, our traditional assessments, our essays and quizzes and things like that. And last year, TEXA, our tertiary education quality and sadness agency, brought out this document. And through that document, it talks through some different options in relation to assessment reform and some of the things we needed to consider. I think there's some real and new opportunities exist for multimodal work and the longitudinal work that ePortfolios can assist us with. One of the recommendations within that report is that a systematic and programmatic approach be taken to assessment that provides multiple means for educators to make judgments about their students' progress without losing the emphasis on feedback and dialogue, et cetera. That is speaking right to the need for ePortfolio to house and to help us mediate program-wide assessment. But then there is this notion of what is appropriate for us to make public. We have this billboard, this public billboard called an ePortfolio or a website that we want to make some of our skills explicit to the general public and to potential employers and all those things that I mentioned before. So what was once seen, though, as the responsibility of an institution to provide a dedicated ePortfolio system to help our practice may not necessarily be achievable, even desirable now. Now, there's a contentious thought. Is it still this notion that there is one system to rule them all in terms of your portfolio? Well, I don't think there is necessarily. And we're seeing institutions opting to host multiple tools and to get their students to use other tools outside of their ePortfolio system. And some institutions have chosen more open tools like WordPress to do that in, which is fine so long as it's scaffolded properly to the students. But there are still, I think, room for a modern ePortfolio platform. There's a cloud-based platform that allows both public and private information to be shared with different audiences, something that some of these open tools do not do. And that forms part of our ecology of tools, our technology-enhanced learning ecology of tools, and which the institution needs to mediate and take some responsibility for. So its ability to host private information and to make that viewable to selected audiences, it's often linked with and by the LMS as a mediator, though in the workforce you won't have an LMS and you know, in many cases in schools you don't have an LMS and for some reason for the three to four years a student is with us, we have this thing called an LMS. Now, I'm not going to go down that little rabbit hole at the moment, but there is this, also this notion that there is this other system, an e-portfolio system that comes in and out of our practice over the time we are a student and it endures longer than something like an LMS does. And this tool houses things like our reflections, our assessments, our group work, 
some of those things that the general public should not see uh, because they are more private. And so an e-portfolio system helps us do that at an institution. And of course, that's thanks to the, the advent of LTI, uh, learning technology and probabilities that our learning management systems can talk to and pass data through uh, to different, different systems. And that continues to expand. So just to finish off with some lessons I've learned in ePortfolio over the last 23 years, there are some significant advantages now, I think, to ePortfolio in terms of program-wide assessment. It really lends itself to an institution thinking differently about assessment and making the assessment span across a whole program of work, not just individual units or individual assessment items within individual units and then into a course. That There's still this notion that where there is some private access to data and that some data just should not be seen by certain people, particularly nowadays with identity theft and things like that. There needs to be data that's kept out of the public eye, but still needs to be housed for the person who's putting together their e-portfolio for different reasons and where they expose. It gives them the choice of where to expose that data. Lifetime access does not mean lifetime access. So when I set up my uh, Mahara e-portfolio at UniSQ, they decide to change systems. And so what happens to that ePortfolio I maintained for you know, over a decade? What happens to that ePortfolio? Well, ultimately, it, it has to disappear. So even though as an alumni of USQ or UniSQ, I have, was given the option to have a, a lifetime ePortfolio with them, that was not possible because they changed systems and I didn't necessarily want to go to the effort years later to change over to a new system when I already had another system underway anyway particularly if that institution is not using a, a platform of their own, if they're going out to WordPress or Wix or any of those other open platforms, those platforms are not necessarily going to be around forever. We see platforms bought out by companies all the time and change their practice and then all of a sudden start charging for that practice, something we don't necessarily want to get our students into. There's also the notion of private pages, as I've already mentioned, where the more important information can be kept and housed quite securely. If we're doing that, though, and in this practice, we need to think around some new standards that need to be developed by universities, those types of things that students should and should not share. Many institutions already have some of these guidelines in place, not all. So I don't necessarily see that when I do sector scans of this, I don't necessarily see that nuanced data or the nuanced information students are the types of things that should be shared on their e-portfolios. Sometimes there's inappropriate information that's shared and particularly to help the students understand what tools are the best for them to share certain information on. Thinking back to that cloud scenario before. Another lesson I've learned is you can't drag people kicking and screaming to e-portfolio. They've got to see the need for that e-portfolio in their own practice. I've worked with academics and professional staff over the years to help them build their own e-portfolio, their own presence, particularly academic staff as they start to think towards promotion. It's a way of collating that information and housing that information in an institutionally safe way. But people don't necessarily get it and don't necessarily want to get it. Some people aren't that out there in terms of wanting to represent themselves, and that's fine. We just don't want to put that pressure on them to do that if they don't need to or want to. But if they do, let's give them the tools to help them do that and to work with them to make a go of it. We are also seeing a number of budget constraints across universities for centralized services. And fortunately, uh, some of the tools are getting easier to use. So there's a, a payoff there, but still, and that's one of the reasons why a number of institutions have gone to third party out there tools that they don't have to support. That's a problem though. The notion of ePortfolio, if we are using it at an institutional level, it's playing a role in linking our technologies. It's around having coherent policy in place around that, the, the right pedagogies to fit the ePortfolio practice we want and the right tools to support that pedagogy. It's the artifact quality and being able to share and being able to share video, being able to share H5Ps, about being able to share uh, journals and things like that. And it's a notion of privacy, student motivation, academic integrity, and of course, not to limit the notion of workload on teaching staff particularly. We need to have that complete picture as we move forward with ePortfolio. The other 
is this notion that ePortfolio itself is ad-free and it's also culturally sensitive. So if we have control of our own systems, we can ensure there is some cultural sensitivity. We can make sure that there are advanced usability tools associated with the system and that we don't have ads and things associated with it. So many sites, uh, if you're using the free versions of those sites, have ads popping up on the screen, which can be culturally insensitive. So there's another important aspect we need to think through. But thank you for hanging with me and I hope you've found this helpful.